You know, it's just exciting to watch destiny unfold uh, in people's lives. Isn't it encouraging when somebody steps into a place of destiny? It just reaffirms that God has a plan for everyone. And we don't, you know, many times we, we get caught up in our own lives and we don't know, so God, what's going on? And then, um, you know, you watch one of those YouTube clips of someone on uh, America's Got Talent, you know, and they're so shy and they're so, you know, they don't look the part of the superstar. And then they open their mouth and they're so amazing. And I always get this sense that this is what they're created for. This is... God made them for this moment, and they step into their moment. And God has those moments for every person. And, you know, not always is it, is it uh, as obvious, because we don't know, but I'm so excited for Sean and Kathy and for Brooke and Barrett as they step into a place of destiny. And I'm so encouraged because, you know, I'm still praying I could too one of these days. <laughs> so, and then just to be part of your family... And, and see the interaction, the years. I tell you what, there really is something about being part of a body for the long haul. And it, it just really is a testimony to be part of a church for 20 years. It's almost, almost unheard of anymore. So I just commend you for your faithfulness and, and for those of you as well that have been around Palestine Church for all these years. And for those of you who are new, you know, it's a family. And you can, the thing is about family, we can't get rid of each other. We just, we, it's messy, and we just got to work through it, and it's all good. So anyway, I got, I got some stuff I got to release to you this morning, and so I'm going to try and um, jump into this. Um, I, I believe, I, let's do this. Just, I just always want to release um, prayer for the sick. We see so much. And so if you need a miracle in your body, just stand up. I, we're, we won't be specific. But just, you need a miracle in your body. You have a need for healing. Just stand up right where you are. Can we do that quickly? There's well, something I found about the supernatural is that it usually happens when, when, when you create an opportunity for it. And one of the ways we create opportunity is by, by taking a moment like this. And, and the other thing is, is when we release testimony. I was just in France just to... Uh, I got back from France. I was in Honduras and so many things, actually a lot of deliverance. Um, but one of the miracles that stood out to me in France was there was a young lady. She had just broken her arm. She had a cast, full cast, all the way, elbow, above the elbow, all the way down. And uh, I remember going back, and, and her thumb was sticking up like this, and I just grabbed her little thumb there, and, and I just prayed a simple prayer, and I asked Jesus to do something and asked her to, can you move your thumb? Because that's, you know, she's completely immobilized. And uh, she came back last night of the conference, and uh, I know she didn't have her cast on. And she goes, I can only stay here a minute, but I got to tell you, I went back to the doctor. They took another x-ray, and there's no break in my arm anywhere. Wow. So, so the reason why I tell that is, is to create another opportunity, because what Jesus does once, he does again. And so, so, Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that are opening right now for those that need miracles. Lord, we just thank you, God, for in a, in a world that is constantly bombarding us with unbelief. Lord, I thank you, Father, that there are testimonies of your faithfulness and your goodness. And we just declare that over each one of these now. If you're around someone who's standing, can you just put your hand on them quickly and let's just pray. Pray your best healing prayer in the name of Jesus and command their pain and sickness to go. Lord, we just thank you. If you put your hand up if you need prayer so we can see who we're praying for so we can... I just love watching the body pray for the people. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, right now for just a release of grace that comes as people touch someone with compassion. Lord, move through their faith right now. God, touch each condition right now, whether it be in their throat, their stomach, their backs, their ears, their eyes. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for miracles, miracles in their bodies in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, as we... Look, we find. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, as they check their bodies today, that they will see significant change in their condition. In Jesus' name, and we just give you all the glory. Amen. Amen. So I just encourage you, the other thing that happens when we pray is 
You want to continue to keep the opportunity for a miracle is to check your body, look, see if it's changed, see if it's different. And so I'm not going to take that time right now just because I want to be efficient, but God doesn't need me to do a miracle, so, so you can check it any time. Okay, the other thing, I saw a couple things while we were worshiping. Uh, it's interesting. I saw this in Nebraska. You see this a lot in this time of year, but uh, there, I, I saw these crop duster planes in the spirit. I just saw these planes swooping down um, and, and covering Palestine. And I just really felt the Lord was saying that he is neutralizing things that are out of control. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Father, for neutralizing things in this area that have been out of control. Lord, any infestations, any sort of, of overgrowth, Lord, we thank you for, for bringing it under your lordship this morning. And, Lord, Jeff so uh, powerfully prayed that out this morning during worship and, and that the Lord loves Palestine. And he's, he's releasing things when, when, uh, when we don't, uh, may not even be aware of it. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. The other thing I saw, this is interesting, I saw a widening of the road to Austin. And I, I saw this connection with Austin. There's something um, back and forth, more significant. And I know some things in the past, just because uh, I know a little bit of history, but this is different than that. This is a different stream. And, uh, and then prophetically, I mean, it's interesting because it's a Highway 79 that goes. Um, they'd already widened that. And so it's kind of all that stuff just kind of just opened up and I just really feel like the Lord is releasing something to Palestine, this area, that's going to be beneficial, significantly beneficial to to Palestine but it's coming from that direction and so Lord, we just want to thank you for Lord, the, the we ask for the blessings and not the curses that come out of uh, Austin in Jesus' name and Lord, we thank you for that. Alright so I think that's all I have in that arena. Um, if you want to turn to Acts chapter 14, I think they're going to have it on screen for you. And I'm going to try and blow through the... Where's the clock, guys? Right up there? Okay. All right. Um, some really exciting things that are happening in the next few weeks. Um, uh, we have several conferences that are starting to unfold in Nebraska. Um, Ricky and I think Bill and Jeff, I, I know Jeff and Ricky are doing a, a conference there in Grand Island. And then Jeff and I are doing a conference in Kearney. And you guys are sure welcome if you're still in the area. Well, you, you are now. You are now. And, so, and then we're going to, uh, going to be in Denver. Jeff and I are going to be in Denver. So really pray for us as we um, really release with the kingdom in, in, in our region. And uh, we're so inter, inter, interconnected that uh, w- what happens in Nebraska is a benefit to what happens here. And what happens here is a benefit to what happens in Nebraska. And so, so be praying for that. All right. You find Acts chapter 14, verse 19 through 22. It says, but the Jews from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derb. After they had preached the gospel to that city and many, made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch and strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. I just want to acknowledge again that you are the great preacher. You are the great teacher. And Lord, would you speak to us today? Would you take your word and make it alive to each person as they hear today? And give me grace to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Paul is stoned. He hasn't been to Denver. Old-fashioned, stoned. But before this, he was actually being celebrated. He was, he was actually being called of God because of a crippled man that had been healed. And they had, were so celebrating him that he, they had to try and calm the crowds because they were trying to just worship them. And then, then these rabble-rousers came down. And uh, in, in, we see in these verses that all of a sudden this whole thing turns and they're being stoned. 
And Paul is stoned to the point of death. Actually, some scholars said that they believe that he was dead and that the disciples that stood around him raised him from the dead. I don't know one way or the other. All I know is that he was under a pile of rocks and it probably hurt. I remember that testimony Brad, the friend of of, uh, Joaquin, talked about the Bethel team that went to uh, somewhere in Africa. And Brad, um, this young man, led this team. And they went into this village to start to preach, and they started pelting them with rocks. They just started throwing rocks at them. And uh, I've heard Jeff's story. He was just telling us about San San Miguel de de Ande. They threw rocks at you. It's like, I give it evidently the devil likes to throw rocks. And so if he can stir up a bunch of people, he's going he's gonna to throw rocks. And so anyway, Brad, you know, his team is being pelted with rocks. So they get their team into a place of shelter. And uh, Brad goes back out. And, and they're, just, they're just hitting him with rocks. And all of a sudden he just, he just cries out, Stop! 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 It hurts! And they just stopped. And so then he began to preach. And the whole village had a significant move of the Holy Spirit. I guess that one message I could preach on that is just that, you know, just on the other side of our, our rocks is, is revival. But, but what I want to preach about today is rocks hurt. Rocks hurt. You know, when you go into life, no one expects to be hit as hard as you get hit. No one, I mean, I've been, in the last few months and year, we've had our own school, interacted with schools, taught in schools down in, in Mexico and Argentina, and there's young ministers coming up, and, and they're all so excited to go change the world, and, and there's a part of me that has this kind of, Motion that I'm sure Paul had when he would talk to young ministers. And it kind of goes like this. Yeah. Yeah, you need to go for it. Remembering all the pains and aches and problems that ministry has, <laughs> has allowed him to experience. But the thing is about Paul, he always got up and moved on. He always, it never stopped him. He went to the next city and just preached again. And so I guess that's another message we could preach out of this is this, you know, don't quit. No matter what you get hit with, you don't, don't quit. This past season, I have, you know, I travel mostly for ministry. I have some local ministry, but mostly I travel. And when, because I travel, I don't get a lot of time with people. And so because of, of just the dynamics of ministry, I come in, I do services, I try to release miracles, I prophesy, I... I try and bring as much of the kingdom of God I can bring in the time frame that I have, and then I leave town. But sometimes the pace slows down enough that I actually get to interact with people and hear their, their stories. And this time in France, I had an opportunity to hear some really tragic things. And, and I was like, dear God, how, how are you functioning how, how, how are you surviving? Because I've not experienced anything like that. I've experienced a lot lighter stuff, and I can barely function sometimes. Because some of the things that people go through are so tragic and so heavy, so heavy that it's really unbearable to really even kind of process. And, and of course, that's why God has called pastors. And he's appointed pastors, because pastors is the ministry gift that walks people through their process. You know, uh, Southern Ministry gifts, we step in, try to release a miracle, an event, significant change, and then we move on. But then there's the people that walk through the process, and God has designed the body to help people while they go through these hard times in life so they can, so they can, so they can win. Jesus, Jesus saw two men that were in the, alongside the road, and they were crying out to him, and Jesus said, bring him here. And the two blind men came to him, and this is what Jesus said to him. What do you want? What do you want? 
What do you want me to do for you? What do you want? And there's an unspoken prayer that I heard in every one of those tragic events as they come because, of course, they're asking me uh, to pray for their situation. You know, horrible abandonment, divorce, uh, kids that, that, that completely have broken relationship with their parents, uh, horrible abuse, just terrible things, terrible things. And, and, I, and I'm processing their pain and trying to have an answer and solution. I'm going to pray for them. And, and so if I could kind of condense down what they're saying, and I, I ask the same question that Jesus asked, what do you want? What, every one of their responses is, you know what, I have this going on in my life. I have this going on in my marriage. I have this going on in my business. I have this, this problem. I have this disease. And I want to win. I want to win. I have all this horrible stuff, and I want to win. You know what? That's what prayer is. Prayer is this come before God who, who has no rival, has no equal, and we believe because of Him that all this stuff has to bow. I want to win. It's, it's our prayer. And we find ourselves like Paul after times of these horrible things that hit us and hit us and hit us and we're laying there and there's no reason for us to get up. We don't want to get up, but there's just something that cries out in our heart. But I want to win. I want, I want to win. Or as the great Spanish prophet says, Nacho Libre, I want to win. I want to win. Now the rest of you, you're gone. The rest of the service, all you can think of is Nacho Libre quotes. I want to win. There's something that God has put inside of every person. And not just believers, but in every person. It's a desire to win. Matter of fact, it kind of, ex- kind of explains really most of life is we're always competing about something. I mean, we played a bunch of games last night as our family. We have my whole family here and, 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 uh, and, and our newest addition to our family almost. Um, we have my daughter JC's friend with us, Drew. So be nice to him because we like him. Ricky? <laughs> <laughs> so we've been just having fun and so last night we played some games and you know what everybody wants to win you know I, I'm though I'm one of those competitive people that I don't really care about little games you can beat me in games you can beat me in stuff but in the important stuff I really want to win stuff that matters I want to win I don't care if you beat me in Monopoly, I can live. I know some of you can't. <laughs> you want to win. <laughs> but but there's a, there is a, by design, part of creation that God has put inside you and I, this desire to win. Because you never know when you're going to be ruthlessly attacked. I was, I was viciously and violently attacked yesterday here in Texas. In a sanctuary, I was at Bill Byer's house. You would think that I'm safe. I mean, that's holy ground. It's a gated community. There should be no sense of any sort of adversarial approach. Faye prays like a machine gun. We are safe under the roof at Bill Byer's house. I go out to turn on the hose, and all of a sudden, I found where those red ants, those fire ants are. And I find myself being viciously and violently attacked by hundreds and hundreds of fire ants as they came up my leg and began to attack me violently. And, and I can tell you, instantly, I wanted to win. 
I want to win, I want to win, I want to win, and I want to win now. But I didn't know how to win. <laughs> and there's a lot of them. And so I'm in this place of panic, and I'm trying to, I don't know what to do, and I'm trying to get the hose off. I'm standing in a fire ant nest, and I'm trying to get the hose off, and it won't think it come off, by the way. Can you report that to Bill, that his hose should be able to be detached? Because... There was too much hose. I couldn't get the hose to spray. It was just plugged up. I needed water because I wanted to win because I was going to drown those little boogers. And so, you know, when you're being attacked, you're just in a place of panic. You just don't know what to do. And so I'm trying to find a solution for this, this, this horrible problem that's happening. And I see another uh, water spigot down the thing. So I ran down there and I got the water and it's already too late. I already have my, my legs are completely bit up. And, but I, but I got myself clean and, uh, and then I went into the garage and I grabbed the can of poison and I stepped in like the Terminator and I, I scorched earth and anything that had any sort of movement. Why? Because I want to win. I want to win. And I have to admit, I had a little vengeance and a little wrath in my desire to win at that moment. But I won. I still have the marks of the battle. But I survived to preach this morning. And so now, as Paul said that I fought the beast... In Ephesus, I can say I fought the fire ants in Texas. And I'm still preaching. But, you know, that's kind of one of those little blips in the screen. But I've I've fought all kinds of beasts doing this ministry thing. Jeff could tell you story after story. You know, for every one of his glorious stories, I'm sure there's there's piles of rocks (laughs) that he just crawled out of. I'm sure Ricky's crawled out a few pile of rocks over the years. And all of you... You know, this is going to be a great year. We prophesy it's going to be a great year. Yeah. As you crawl out of piles of rocks. And then Paul, he says these words. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting that he was, he says that. But just before that, he went to, made many disciples, and then he he encouraged them to continue in the faith. There's this strange balance between what we go through and the stuff and the pain and the victory. I want to win. I want to win, but I don't win all the time. I hate losing. I want to win, but I don't always win. And those are the, those are the marks. Those are the pains. Those are the stuff that, that, that doesn't go away. Everybody faces tragedy. There's no escaping it. There's stuff. That, you know, we know this to be true. But as believers, we somehow just want to believe that somehow I can avert any sort of pain in life. And it's an impossibility. Now, I believe you can lessen it. I believe that many things can be changed. But you know what? You're still going to lose people that you love because everybody dies. People are going to move away that you love. There's people that that are in your life now, that won't be in your life. Everybody deals with something. Your kids are going to grow up. They're not going to be babies. They were so cute. And now they grow up to be these mouthy... No, they don't. (laughs) Mouthy, funny, beautiful young ladies that are a little catty every once in a while. But that's... But... And then they go off to be adults, which is what we celebrate, but then they're not... Everybody faces. Let's make it easy. But it's life. And so that's the life, that's, that's the planet we live on. But I got good news. You want to win. And it's okay that you want to win. Matter of fact, it's necessary that you want to win. And you need to know some things about this. Is the devil hates you. 
I've said this in other settings, but it's so true. The devil hates you more than the media hates Donald Trump. And the media hates him. They're relentless. Well, that's nothing compared to the spiritual opposition that the devil has night and day accusing you. Sometimes you can even hear it. He is accusing. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. God has a plan for your life, but so does the devil. And so, as long as we're on this planet, there's going to be these, these times where we want to get stoned, but we get stoned. That's a joke. You, some of you will catch it in a little while. Ha, ha, ha. All right. So, why do you want to win? Well, number one, you want to win because it's your old nature to win. It says this in, in, Gala- in uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over the creeping things that creeps on the earth. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Doesn't that sound like someone's going to win? God created mankind to subdue, to have dominion. That he created you to be fruitful and multiply. And so by design, the human, the human nature wants to conquer something, wants to build something, wants to climb something, wants to conquer something. You know what? It's amazing that even unbelievers can do amazing things. Why? It's because they want to win. They want to beat it. It's like, what's, what's the highest mountain? I want to climb it. What's, what's the hardest thing? You know, I have a, a nephew that, that went into the service. He wants to be a, wants to be a SEAL or, or a special forces. It's like, dude, why? Why don't you just drive a truck? <laughs> you know? No, because he wants to win. He wants to compete at the highest level. He wants to be the best of the best. He's driven for that. You know, other people are driven for others. People want to be great musicians, want to be great, want to be great teachers. Want, it's like we want to be the best. Why? It's because by design, God created human beings to be great, to be amazing, to accomplish things, to do things, to, to, to subdue, do things. And so, so even, even if you weren't a believer, there's a part of you that wants to win. I want to win. I want to win. I want to win. So, so it's your old nature, but you know what? It's even part of your new nature, even more so. It says this in 1 John 5, 4. Listen to this. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. Our old nature wants to win, but even more, our new nature wants to win. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that's overcome the world, is our faith. I just want to say this. That the new nature, the new nature is so powerful. Then this Jesus part of you, it's really indestructible. It's eternal. Matter of fact, you can crush the outer, but you can never crush the inner. If you have eternal life, you're going to live forever. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? If you've accepted Jesus Christ, then you have been made a new person. You've been born of the Holy Spirit. You are absolutely, eternally indestructible. Boom! That'll get you through some rock piles. So your old nature wants to win, but it has limitations. But your new nature wants to win, but it doesn't have limitations. Because it's connected to the one who has no rival. The one who has no equal. And so what does that produce in us? Faith. It produces in the expression of this new nature. The expression of, of this, this born again spirit is faith. Which is, again... Lord, I'm facing this. I'm up against this. I want to win. That's your faith. Jesus turns to the, to the blind men. What do you want? What do you need? What do you want me to do? Jesus, I'm blind. I want to win. Jesus turns to the, to the lady whose husband just left. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus, 
My husband's gone. I want to win. I, do, I want to win. I want to overcome. Because that's her nature. That's the nature of the born-again believer. Is I want to win. Jesus, help me win. I believe I'm supposed to win. And that expression is our faith. But we don't win all the time. And that's why Paul said what he said. Is that, you know what, through many tribulations you're going to go into the kingdom. The stuff that you're going to want, you're going to will, and you're going to wish. And it's not going to happen. It's interesting the way this verse is written. It says that this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Victory is not defined by winning a battle. It's defined by the condition of your faith after the battle. I want to say that again. Victory is not defined by winning a battle. Victory is defined by the condition of your faith after the battle. Because think about it. When you feel like you've lost the thing that is the most challenged is your faith. When you feel like what you believe God for didn't happen, it tries to shape your faith. So if you want to win, no matter what happens, you get up. God, you are good. God, you are powerful. God, all things are possible. And I believe good things are coming. Right out of all your pain. And Jesus looks down and says, you win. I know you hurt. I know you've been through stuff. I know you wanted that to happen. It did not happen. I'll explain to you later. But you win. Not everybody wins, by the way. Because not everybody emerges from the battle. Not everybody emerges from the rock pile with faith. Some people never crawl out of the rock pile. Because their expectations was, you know what? I wanted to win. I didn't win. So I must have lost. But you know what? If God doesn't look at things like we do, he doesn't measure our life based on battles we've won. He measures our life. What do you believe? What do you believe today? It's like, Jesus, you know, I've had those days. I don't know what I believe. It's a good thing you gave me your word so you could remind me what I'm supposed to believe. Because some days it's just hard. Because what the battles do is they try to redefine what I believe. And it's probably the greatest challenge of our faith is to not let circumstances reshape it when our expectation of a battle has been challenged. So, so the real battle is after the battle. And the question you have to ask yourself after you've been through something is, what do I believe now? What do I believe? And if you want to win, what happens to you can't change what you believe. Everybody goes through horrible things at some point. Some people have been through horrible things, but you know what? People that have been through stuff and can still say God is good, God is powerful, all things are possible, they change the world. Those are the people I want to listen to because they've been through stuff and they still love unashamedly. You know, how do you love when people are throwing rocks at you? When your nature is, I want to win in the natural. I want to start a war. You're hurting me. I'm going to hurt you. How do you win when it seems like you're losing because you're being hit physically? How do you come back and win spiritually? Well, you can love unashamedly in the midst of a rock fight. Because you believe 
God is good. God is powerful. God is love. He loves these people even though they hate me. I guess that's why it's so hard sometimes. See, he wants, the devil wants, he so much wants to label you after a, a failure as a loss, as a loser. You're a loser, you lost. I won that one. You prayed and they died. I won. You're a loser. You ever hear that voice? There's always this mocking voice. But you need to remind the devil that I'm sorry. My old nature is a winner. And my new nature even more. I am a winner by design. And I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you throw at me. God has no equal and God has no rival. God is for me and not against me. I don't understand this. I can't even begin to put things into slots. But I know this much. He loves me. He's for me. And this will not define me. And even though these rocks hurt. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to the next place and I'm going to tell those people that God is good and that God is powerful and that God is able. And I'm going to strengthen people's faith even though I think I lost that last one. It's hard to stand up here. It's easy after victory. It's hard after loss. We've just had some dear brothers this past year in our church there in Kearney pass away. Kind of unexpectedly, no one saw it coming. And it's like, they're not here. What do you do with that? Well, we win. You know, they actually won. They're not here. They won. There is, they're eternal. We're still here. So it's really how you define victory. But it doesn't make the process of dealing with loss any less painful. But it doesn't make us losers. I've really struggled with this my whole life because I want to win. And one of the consequences of wanting to be a winner is when you lose, does it label you? And I have to say that I evidently have a tendency towards that. And I throw up my hands and say, well, there must be something wrong with me because I lost. So I must be a loser. And that's why what I'm preaching today isn't really for you. This is my therapy. Because some of the stuff I don't have solutions for, and I want to have solutions for everything. Matter of fact, I want, I want to win, and I want you to win. I believe that's ministry. As we preach every week, because, because we want you to win. And we want the way you win to look like Jesus, which might be even encouraging you after what seems like a loss. You did have a divorce. Well, guess what? God is still good. God is still powerful. God still has a plan for your life. God is still working good in your life, even though it looks like you lost here. What's your faith condition right now? Because if your faith is good, you win. You can still show up on Sunday morning. I've been through hell. The smile's real because he's real. I hurt. The rocks are real. But you know what? You know, all suffering is incomparable to his suffering. So I believe. I believe. I want to win. So I want to give you some things, really, just to be a little bit pastor off. How to win. You want to know how to win? All right. Here's a few practical things. This this stir up the old pastor in me. I'm going to give you something real practical. Number one is you have to prepare. If you want to win in a battle, you prepare, right? 
It says in Proverbs 21, verse 31, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. So everybody's got to get your horse ready. Everything in life that you want to be good at, you have to practice. Nothing happens the first time. Sometimes we lose in some situations because it takes a, a, a persistence of doing the same things over and over and over again until you get to a level of, of, of victory. Where you can, you can do it in the real world, in real situations. So, so there's a preparation that is natural. There's preparation that's spiritual. And so there's, there's preparation involved in winning. Number two is, is you have to plan to win, but you can't trust the plan. That's what it says in Psalms 33, 17. A horse is a false hope for victory. The Lord, you just told me to prepare my horse. The horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Lord, which is it? Is it preparation and planning? Well, have you ever noticed plans don't ever go the way you have them planned? And, and so there's a preparation there's the things that we do, the things that we position ourselves, we read, we study, we pray, we go to church, we, we receive this instruction on how to win. But when it comes down to winning, you can't trust the things that we've told you. You have to trust Him. Because He is a person. He's not a plant. And so really what we're trying to do is we give you equipment so that you can trust Him, but you can only use the equipment that He allows you to use in the battle. You might be a great speaker, and the Lord tells you to be silent. It's like, because really winning, if you want to win, you're going to have to do it because you trust Him. I want to just blow up one of the, the biggest Christian lies that we were told in the last 20 years, is that if, if you do things right... If you believe these scriptures, you pray these things, one, two, three, and do all the things perfectly, then you will win. There's no such thing as perfect Christianity. There's no such thing as doing it perfect. And matter of fact, some of you feel like you've lost battles because you didn't do it perfect enough. Well, that's a lie. You can't do it perfect enough. I preached a message years ago. And this was the title, God Doesn't Need Your Ducks. Because we spend all our life trying to put our ducks in a row. And God doesn't need your ducks. He needs you. He needs you to believe and do what he says to do when he says to do it. And your ducks are nice and he may or may not use them. So I don't want to discourage you from preparation. I don't want to discourage you from equipping. I don't want to discourage you. I just don't want you to trust in those things because God doesn't need your ducks. You can, you can do all the financial stuff exactly the way the financial guy says to do it and still have financial problems. But I guarantee you, if you trust God, it might look different for you and you will still win. And even if you don't win like you think you should win, if you still believe after the battle, you still win. Because really that's the most important thing anyway. It's not whether or not I was able to build that bigger house that I dreamed and planned on building. But really, it's about whether or not I'm right where God wants me to be. I don't need this stuff anyway to be successful. I want this stuff, but I don't need this stuff. Another thing that you need to do if you want to win is you need to have people around you. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there's no guidance, the people fail, but in abundance of counselors, there's victory. There's a reason why we gather together. Because you know what? Some days I'm losing, but you're not. You can speak to my... I need perspective sometimes. I need your counsel. I need to be connected to people that have been through stuff that I've not been through. So that's why being connected in a body is, is important to winning. If you want to win, you've got to be able to hear what the voice of winners are saying. You need the voice of wisdom. And then the last thing, if you want to win, you need to understand that you can be beat up and still win. A battering 
reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish until he leads justice for victory. Victory is not not being beat up. Victory is getting up after you've been beat up. And so, one of the things I want to do today is I want to pray that his victorious overcoming spirit would be reignited in you become of, because some of you have been shamed because you want to win. There's a part of you that, that begins to rise up against things in your life, but then you start feeling shame. So no, you don't deserve that. No, you don't, you don't deserve that. You don't deserve to win. You don't deserve to overcome that. You don't deserve it. Well, that's just not true. You're not a loser. You are a winner, and by nature, by nature, there's something inside a person who believes that no matter what you put us through, no matter how many rocks you pile on us, no matter how far in the ocean you try to drown us, we got this little buoyant little cork thing that is called this overcoming life, and no matter what you do with it, it's going to pop to the surface. You just let, just give it a little wiggle room, and that sucker is going to come flying up to the surface. Why? Because I want to win, and I have the overcoming one inside me. And even if I don't win in this life, I'm going to pop into eternity. And right out of the devil's grips and stuff and garbage and I'm going to be with Jesus. Death, where is your victory? We win. We win. You win. You win. I know you hurt, but you win. But don't be ashamed that you want to win. Because I know that's happened to me. Because when I feel ashamed, I feel like I deserve. I deserve the rocks. I deserve the problems. Well, I probably did something to deserve this, right? I probably didn't do it perfect enough. And you know what? With that belief system, you'll never crawl out of the rocks. And so I want you to grab hold of the victorious spirit that's in Jesus that wants to win. And I want you to embrace it because it will be the strength you need on the worst days. And matter of fact, if you can't do it, he will do it in you because it's his spirit anyway. It's not you. Matter of fact, I can't tell you how many times I couldn't do it. I don't want to get up. I can't get up. But then all of a sudden something in me gets up. Well, I guess we're going to the next city. And I guess what are we going to say when we get there? Well, I guess we're going to tell them and encourage them in the faith. But you know what? We're going to go through stuff. Many tribulations enter the kingdom. And I I'm, I'm guarantee you, he could still feel the pain of his situation. But he was still able to encourage them in their faith. That's what we do. Because we are winners. Let's bow our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the victorious spirit that you gave us in Jesus Christ. I thank you for this eternal life, this doesn't this indestructible life that is your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would break off that immobilizing shame that Somehow, because I failed or I have problems or I have pain, that somehow I have lost or I'm a loser. And I break in Jesus' name any label or power that has tried to restrict the ability to stand again. Because after we've done all, we stand and we stand firm. Do you have that video? Okay. I'm going to put on a song. There's really nothing to the video. It's just a song. And so I want you just to sit in the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to pray after this. We're going to go into time of ministry. But I just want to let this song, let the words of the song just sing over your soul. 
as you receive from the Lord right now. So go ahead and close your eyes. Like I said, it's just a guy playing his guitar. So if you can go ahead and play, the war is over. <laughs> 